Hey guys, welcome into another Conversations episode. This time on the pod, I'm joined by Toby Bell Bowen. Toby currently runs the Sprint Car Hub YouTube channel and was a sprint car driver in Australia for many years. He even spent some time racing in California and with the World of Outlaws. We talk about his career, why he had to step away from driving, the creation of Sprint Car Hub, the future of racing in Australia, and a bunch more. Please enjoy the show. You have a, a Sprint Car YouTube channel, which we will certainly get to uh, here in, in this conversation, but I, I want to start with kind of your own Sprint Car career, and, and obviously those people that are tuning in at this point um, can hear your accent and they know that you're you're not American, but Sprint Car Racing is is obviously a very big deal uh, down under, and and you know I've had people on this show, and we had people back in on Open Red back in the day from Australia, plenty, um, but tell me about your kind of foray into sprint car racing like did you grow up a fan like why was this something you wanted to get involved in yeah so i'm from uh sydney in uh new south wales australia and uh my i guess my story is a bit like you know a lot of people's uh my dad was a was a racing fan growing up and uh you know he didn't have a lot of money growing up but uh he built a, a smash repair business which i think you guys call a a body shop and, uh, you know, eventually when he was in his, in his thirties, uh, he, he had enough money to, to go racing himself. And, uh, he raced, uh, midgets or we call them speed cars over here and, uh, had also had a, a spring car career as well. So, um, he raced for a number of years. Um, I don't really remember that. That was, I think he finished up, you know, in the mid to late nineties. So I was only a few years old and, uh, my brother was racing, uh, my older brother, Roddy, he's, he's five years older than me, started racing go-karts during that time. And, uh, I started racing a few years later and, and then, uh, Roddy started racing spring cars in, uh, the mid two thousands. And then in about 2010, um, I, I moved into, into spring cars as well. And, um, yeah, you know, like we, we raced together and there were some pretty cool memories, but yeah, it, it's, I guess you could say like it's it's been in our family a long time i know it sounds really cliche and and all that but yeah like we, we really have been surrounded by racing um you know ever since I, i've known you know i've grown up so i don't know any different what uh before you get in sprint cars or i mean did you run midgets did you run carts like you know what, what did you run and where were you running at yeah so uh i my brother and i both race carts um pretty much all around australia mostly on the you know the eastern um, side of Australia and uh, you know that that was um, that was pretty weekly like we we had a, we did a lot of racing more like circuit stuff um, we also had like uh, dirt carts um, you know on, on an oval so you know we were we were surrounded by racing all the time and and you know I race with guys that are racing in, in supercars now um, so did my brother um, you know, and a lot of guys that are obviously made it in, in, in speedway or spring car racing. And, um, my brother even raced with, uh, Daniel Ricardo, who's, who's in F1 now. So, um, you know, when everyone was kind of going their separate ways, um, you know, once you become a, a teenager and that we never had any intention of kind of going to that, that asphalt route, you know, like it just didn't interest us. We, we're big speedway fans and, and, you know, love spring car racing. And, and that was kind of always our goal. Um, yeah. To, to go dirt racing. What is the like hierarchy kind of of motorsports in, in Australia? And I would assume that supercars is up there, but like, you know, here in, in the U S we've got NASCAR, we've got IndyCar, you know, we've got all these other sports on top of that. And, and like dirt racing is, you know, we refer to it as grassroots here where it's kind of local racing and it's obviously on a much smaller scale, but in terms yeah. of kind of the sports and motorsports landscape, like what does that kind of look like in Australia? Yeah, so I would say definitely the obvious one is supercars is, you know, our version of NASCAR, um, although they don't race on ovals at all. Um, we used to have a NASCAR back in the day. Um, that's long gone. Um, but, yeah, dirt racing, you know, people call it grassroots racing, but I just feel like, you know, it, it's kind of dumbing it down and, and a little bit degrading for our sport um, because, you know. As I, I you kind of know, agree with you, by the way. I don't, I don't love calling it grassroots either. Yeah. And it's, um, it's so much more than that. And, uh, you know, the guys and teams that are in it are so elite, but, um, you guys have IndyCar as well. We don't have, uh, really a big, uh, sing, you know, a single seater open wheel, um, you know, asphalt series. 
Um, we have versions of that sort of stuff, but it's just not big. Like you got to remember, you know, America has, I think it's 13 times the population of Australia. So anything we do or anything we have is, is just so much smaller on a smaller scale. Um, but yeah, you know, if you were to come from uh, racing carts, you'd go to something which I think it's now Formula Four, um, which is pretty worldwide now. And uh, we used to have Formula Ford. Um, that was your intro into like single seater racing. And, and as you kind of progress, you might go to like a lower category of supercars. It's funny, you go from go karts to, you know, a Formula single seater open wheel. And then it's like, we don't have anywhere to go here in Australia. You just go into, um, you know, our version of, of stock car racing, really. So you just kind of jump ship, you know, naturally anyway, um, unless you want to go over to Europe or go to the States and, and pursue something. So for us, like, it was just, it was, it's pretty crazy. I, I raced a, a, a Rotax go-kart, which is like got, I think like 30 horsepower and, this is when I'm 15. And then a few weeks later, it was like, all right, we're going sprint car racing. And here's this 900 horsepower sprint car. So it was, it was, I remember my first time driving a sprint car and it was just like, oh my God, how could anyone ever get used to something like this? It's, <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's not even comparable, but um, yeah, it, once you drive a sprint car for the first time, you don't ever want to race anything else. Do you guys in Australia have like, I mean, obviously here we've got, you know, like the War of Outlaws are 410 sprint cars. And then, you know, we've got ASCS, which is 360s and there's local 305 racing and 358. It's like, do you guys have like those kind of different steps or it's like once you go sprint car racing, like you're just in a 410? Yeah. So again, we have stuff like that, but it's a lot smaller. We do have 360s. Um, if you could see a map of Australia, we have 360s are bigger um, or I think they only run really down in South Australia. Um, I think some in Victoria and uh, Western Australia, like for some reason, no one runs them uh, here in, in Sydney and, and, and Queensland. There might be, you know, engines out there racing with the 410s, but as far as like a class, we don't, um, yeah, 360s, we have an Australian um, 360 title. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just not as big of a, a class over here. And I guess because we don't have the depth, like the, although we have big numbers, we don't have the depth of, um, of racing uh, and, and races and teams like you guys do in the States. So to have, you know, a sprint car class um, healthy, we, everyone's in four tens, which I gotta be honest, I'm not angry about, you know, we don't, we don't definitely uh, have, uh, I don't know of any three Oh fives and, and three five eights and stuff like that. It's all, it's basically, I'd say 95% four tens and, and some, and some three sixties. When you are racing, uh, you know, did you do world series? Did you do ultimate sprint car? Were you mostly kind of like at, at Valvoline or, or Sydney speedway? Like what is your career kind of breakdown when, when you're racing in Australia? Yeah. So, uh, Valvoline raceway is that, um, in a, a town called Parramatta and that's about half an hour from where I live, um, West of that. So, um, we, we predominantly raced at Valvoline Raceway. Um, I raced for seven seasons and, you know, you guys race like 90 to hundred races a year. I was lucky to do like, you know, 30 something, you know, like we, we just don't have, um, you know, it was also a family team. So I was kind of growing towards that to, to start racing, um, and travel more. Um, I did race in Queensland a little bit, a little bit down South. Um, but predominantly, you know, the, I would say the best track in Australia was, it feels weird to say was, but, um, was Valvoline Raceway. And, and we were so lucky that it was so close by. Um, and, and we had a, you know, how like, uh, not every track has a, a weekly, uh, series or, or championship. We had that at Valvoline Raceway. So there was being a good track and having a weekly series and good prize money. There was no reason to really travel that often world series is although it's our version of world of outlaws there's like i think last time i saw there's like maybe 16 rounds or something you know so it's it starts halfway through summer whereas you guys are starting you know your season in our summer like it, it's so so much longer and bigger and we don't have the again everything's smaller we don't have the the amount of tracks to go to um, that can hold spring car racing and that. So, um, you know, spring car racing is a little different here in Australia. And for our team, um, yeah, we predominantly raced um, at Valvoline Raceway. How did you do? Uh, okay, so 
to put it in a nutshell, I never won a feature race. And that, <laughs> you know, people probably think, you know, uh, you know, that sounds pretty bad. Obviously, it doesn't sound good, but you know, it doesn't bother me at all. I, I feel like I did well for um for where I started um and kind of what I was dealt. Um, you know, the reason I stopped racing was because of my my vision, which I've always had uh, problems with. And, uh, you know, to look back on it, I go, yeah, I, you know, I didn't do as well, you know, anywhere near as what I wanted to do and, and didn't race as much as I wanted to and, and do the things I wanted to. But, you know, I'm definitely proud of, I think everyone's got a starting point. And when you start out, you know, as a 15 year old racing a, a sprint car and you, you have no idea what you're doing <laughs> and, and you struggle so much and you're so slow to then, um, you know, run decent at some of the bigger races. And, you know, uh, you know, one of the cool things was getting uh, quick time at the, the Warnable Classic, which is um, our, our Knoxville Nationals, really. Um, you know, I had some cool finishes where I, you know, uh, beat good guys, you know, and finish on the podium with, with guys like, um, you know, McFadden and, and Robbie Farr. And, you know, some of my, my best races, I, I beat guys like Brad Sweet, you know, these are guys that are, you know, there's no one better, but for the, probably the, the one time that I beat Brad Sweet, he, he beat me the other nine, you know, out of 10. So it's, yeah, and kicks my ass too. So um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy and definitely content kind of with the career I had, although, you know, I wish I was still racing and, and wish I did a, a lot better, but it is what it is. And I think everything happens for a reason. The, the reason that I kind of know or knew, knew who you were is like you came over to the States and and I, I mean, I remember when you made your first World of Outlaws start because I was working for the Outlaws at the time. And and then I, you know, I run across you on YouTube and I'm like, hey, wait a minute. So, you know, I mean, you kind of start messaging back and forth. But tell me about your trip to the States and, and getting the opportunity to do that. Yeah. So when I was about, uh, I think, 22, uh, no, it would have been, yeah, 19 or 20. Um, and you know, my career was kind of like, I was finishing on the podium and, and, and doing well. And, you know, every Australian driver's goal is to eventually, you know, go over to the States and try and make a career. And some guys really, um, start off well, like you look at someone like Lockie McHugh, who's doing really well, like incredibly well, mm -hmm. um, from the get go. And then other guys go over there and you think, Oh God, like, you know, that wasn't very good. And no one remembers it. Um, you know, I'd say, yeah, mine was probably towards that one. But, uh, I, you know, I wanted to to race in the States. And um, obviously, you know, Peter Murphy over in California, he grew up in uh, Blacktown, which, again, is about half an hour, not even maybe 20 minutes away from from where we are. And he's actually Blacktown is the is the I guess the council of where the new Eastern Creek Speedway is going. So um, that's where Peter grew up and and he knew my dad really well. They, they raced together and. Um, for a number of years and, and stayed in contact and are still good friends today. And uh, when I wanted to race over there, um, it just happened that, you know, I got in contact with Peter and, you know, I was like, hey, can you, you know, let me know if anything pops up or, you know, what we can do. And, and uh, randomly one day, I remember working in the race shop and I get this message saying, hey, I've organized, like he's organized just about everything. Here's how it's going to work. And, uh, you know, we I was like, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Um, you know, I'm not blind to the fact that, you know, anything like this is, is an awesome opportunity. So I was like, you know, I, I wasn't sure if it, had, you know, even end up happening, but um, Peter, um, yeah, put it all together. And um, yeah, I went over to California in 2015 and 2016. And uh, we raced mainly, uh, there was a mix of um, 410 and 360 races. I've never raced a 360 here in Australia. So to go over there, it was, was um was pretty cool to, to do that as well and um you know i had a i had a lot of fun and learn a lot with peter a lot of contacts um to race with the world of outlaws is so cool to me because um we actually went to the gold cup at chico in 2000 and i went there 15 years later and raced myself it was that, that was kind of a cool moment and um you know, I, I'm definitely, like I said, I'm not blind to the fact that these are really cool opportunities and, and not everyone gets to do them. So I was very fortunate to to get to race in California with Peter. Uh, how did you do uh, in some of those races, especially against the Outlaws? And, and what was the feeling like? I, I love hearing from people like that first time you kind of roll out on the track and you look around and you're like, oh, crap, I'm actually doing this. <laughs> 
Well, my first race was at Chico, um, you know, in America, uh, not with the Outlaws. Um, I remember qualifying eighth and uh, actually for some reason, I have no idea why, uh, maybe they still do it, but for eighth uh, quick, you uh, got $100 for some reason. It was just a random eighth quick in, in time trials was $100 and I've still got the, the $100 here in, in my study, <laughs> um, you know, in the envelope that they gave me. Um, but yeah, no, uh, it, it was cool. Like, I have no idea. You've heard all these names, like, you know, Dirt Vision didn't used to be video. It was just audio. And throughout our winter, we would work um, on our cars and listen to Dirt Vision um, all the time. And, you know, I'd hear names like, you know, Andy Forsberg or, or Shane Golubic and um, all these guys. And I don't know if they're like, you know, 17-year-olds or if they're like 50-year-olds. I had no idea. Yeah. You know, and we didn't know like really what their cars looked like. Like I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't know um, who I was racing with really. So I remember my first heat race, um, I think, uh, you know, 10 laps, I think for half of it, I held uh, might've been Andy Forsberg or one of the other, you know, California local guys behind me and, and people come in and they're like, you know, you did pretty good to hold him back. I'm like, who was it? I don't know who that guy was. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it, it was fun. It was tough. I will say it was tough. Um, we probably weren't as planned and, and um, prepared um, as well. But we should have been going racing over there. Racing with the Outlaws was incredibly tough. Um, again, the reason I stopped racing was because my eyesight's not the best. And, and I knew that for a while and kind of tried to um, put it off and, and convince myself that I, I was all good. You know, I wanted to pursue my, my racing career. But, um, you know, when you're racing with the world of Outlaws, and, you know, I, I remember going out for time trials, which was kind of my, my thing, you know, I was like, if I'm going to do well at anything, I, I can at least qualify well. And, you know, to be like, you know, four or five tenths off the pace um, in time trials with the outlaws just goes to show how good they are. Those, those guys literally roll into town. It doesn't matter if it's a quarter mile, half mile, you know, low bank, high banked, whatever it is. Um, they just come in and be like, all right, we're going to kick your ass tonight and then we're going to go to the next track and do the same thing. <laughs> so, um, no, it was, although it was an ass kicking, it was, it was a lot of fun. How did you know? I, I know you've had some surgeries and some different things for your eyes. How did you kind of know and get to that point where you're like, I just can't do this anymore? Yeah, so I had uh, eye problems. Oh, like my eyes haven't been the best. I've worn glasses since I was in like kindergarten. So, uh, um, my eyesight was, yeah, never great, but, um, you know, I've had a couple of crashes where it's kind of shaken me up a bit. Um, and for whatever reason, it's like my eyes are, are my, my weak point. And, um, right before I, oh, the last probably three, four years of my racing, um, so more than half of my, my spring car racing career, uh, I really, really did struggle. Um, not, so, you know, my vision would be the same, but, it was more my, the health of my eye. Um, I had a, I developed a condition called glaucoma, which, you know, if you're like 60 or 80 years old, um, um, you know, you get this problem, which is like high pressure in your eye. And, uh, you know, I was like 19 <laughs> and, uh, basically it was like so painful that I had to have, um, to have medication for that. And, and, I've never actually really said it, you know, kind of public to anyone, but you, you know, you're not meant to have the medication when you're, when you're racing, cause it makes you feel like lethargic and, and drowsy. So I had to be really careful when I went racing that I didn't have my medication within like 24 hours of going racing. Um, and I, my, you know, it was so painful to, to want to go racing and, and my eye is in pain and my, you know, like I said, my, my vision sucked and, you know, if your eye has this high pressure that uh, eventually you can, you can basically go blind from it. So I had to kind of um, have a few, I had emergency surgeries and uh, I had three surgeries um, all every February for like three, you know, um, three years in a row. Um, I had a surgery and, and missed races because of that. So, you know, if I'm doing, you know, 30 races or something, I've missed, you know, four or five, you know, to have my surgery and, um, I had cataract surgery in my eye um, because it was um, affected the lens in my eye um, after having those other surgeries. And uh, basically it came down to, we have just after the Knoxville Nationals is run in August, a couple of weeks later, we have a series here um, up in Darwin, which is like the Northern Territory. 
and it's always hot there. So it's like the middle of our winter, but it's hot up there. And uh, that we were planning to go up there um, basically as the start of um, the next season. And I remember just realizing I've had my, sur- my last surgery and my eyes were uh, meant to clear up um, by this stage and, and they just never kind of came good as, you know, um, to what they should be. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, to answer your question, I remember uh, realizing that and, and just kind of sending a message to um, the guys on my team and, and my parents who were, who were, you know, obviously, um, you know, it's a family owned team. So I, I just said, hey, like, I, as much as I really want to go to Darwin, I, um, my eyes aren't very good. And, and I like, I just don't think I can see that well as what I used to. And, um, you know, my parents were so good about it that um, we kept our, you know, our, uh, our 48 foot trailer, we kept our prime mover, we kept all the cars, um, engines, like we had a full race team to run for probably a couple of years um, without buying anything. And, you know, we kept that for two years, just sat, um, sat at home. And uh, they were so good about it to, to wait for me to come good. And, and eventually it got to the stage where it was like, hey, you know, you know, it's not going to happen. And, uh, um, you know, that was, that was a pretty hard thing to deal with. So you just kind of, I think, you know, the slow burn of accepting it was, was what made it okay. Um, but, yeah, it, 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 it sucks to kind of give away your dream because, you know, it doesn't matter how much time or money or effort that you put into anything, you know, sometimes there's things out of your control that you can't um, do anything about. And if you could, you would. So, um, you know, I felt like we put in so much money um, and I was putting in the time in every area that I possibly could. Um, It was the only thing I cared about and and made it my life. And um, to have it, taken away by something that was like kind of I guess wrong with you is just like what can I do we have a thing here in Australia um you know I think anyone can basically go over there and race um and it's your your uh choice if you want to get like insurance and over here we have to get uh, a license through uh Speedway Australia and one of the requirements not for every class but for sprint car racing you have to get a medical every year and I remember thinking, okay, um, let's just get things organized because when my eyes do come good, I'll, I'll go racing. So I went to the doctor and I was like, okay, I'll get my, my medical. And I passed with everything. Everything's fine. Um, and then I said, oh, you know, like my eyes aren't good, but like, you know, when they come good, if, as long as I, I've already got my medical, I can get my license. And uh, he's like, man, I, <laughs> I can't sign you off. Like you, you can't see, <laughs> you know, so, um, so yeah, like I, that basically if I didn't make the choice to stop racing, um, I wasn't going racing anyway, cause I couldn't pass medical. Where like, uh, you know, are you like, are you working through all this? Like, do you have a job kind of outside of racing and, and I, you know, obviously kind of, what do you do now for work? Yeah. So I'm a, I work full time. I'm a fitter and machinist um for a hydraulic place in blacktown actually so um just half an hour from here um yeah so i've always been working i've been working for 10 years since i since i left school and um yeah i'm a a qualified fitter and machinist i do some welding and can fabricate and and things like that so again i made that choice to go into that industry because i wanted to be able to to work on my race cars um and and learn about you know metal and and how things worked and and to be handy when, when working in the race shop. And, um, you know, I love it. I enjoy it. Um, but yeah, this whole time between, you know, the end of my career and, and, uh, balancing, you know, spring car racing and my eye health and working full time, like it, it got pretty tough and, um, yeah, it's, it's not something I'd wish kind of on anyone. <laughs> Where like, you know, you, okay. So you decide to, to kind of stop racing and, and, you know, do you kind of go through a period where like, you don't want to be around it? You like, did you go to the racetrack? I, I feel like, you know, you talk to some people and they're like, once it's kind of over, they just don't want to have anything to do with it. And then other people are like, no, no, I want to stay involved and they'll go work on cars. They go to the racetrack or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I want to kind of transition into like the YouTube channel and stuff, but, wh- but where has racing kind of been since you quit driving? Yeah. So uh, when I had to stop racing, it's a, it's a very, very weird feeling. 
um, and, and it hurts to go to a racetrack and see spring cars, um, you know, or any category that, you know, you used to be a part of and to just be standing around uh, and, and not part of it. You just, it's, you feel very lost. And uh, I remember that first night I actually got um, asked to work on a team with a guy named Glenn Beaton, who's, who's a pretty known, well, well-known well uh, crew chief here in Australia. And he used to work with um, guys over in the States too. Um, and, and so I helped them out and it just feels weird to be at the racetrack and working on someone else's car and just kind of stand around. You're like, man, like this is, this is your life. You're watching it kind of, you know, everything slip away in front of you. So, uh, you know, I, I imagine every driver feels like that. Even someone like Steve Kinzer must feel so weird to, to go to a racetrack when that was his life. And, and you just kind of go, okay, I'm not doing that anymore. Um, so for me, I, I didn't know what to do. Um, but, I didn't go to the track as often. Um, I still watch racing and that, but um, I got a call up uh, a few days before Christmas of that year. I think it was 2017. I could be wrong. Um, but I got a call up from the the people who were doing clay per view, which is our version of dirt vision. Yep. And they said, Hey, do you want to come on and do some commentary um, for boxing night, which is like basically our big, our big night of the year. And uh, I it's was like, like at, yeah, at Christmas sure. time, like, right? I, I would... Yeah. Like so a... yeah, yeah, Boxing yeah. Day. I don't think you guys call it Boxing Day, do you? Mm-hmm. Um, the day after Christmas, um, because yeah. obviously it's summer here and, it, and it's so hot. Um, and so we have like that whole week or the next probably five weeks is so busy building up to the Warrnambool Classic down south. And we, uh, I, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll I'll do that. What do you want me to do? And they were like, you know, we just want you to kind of comment on things that you see um and, and yeah don't expect you know kind of to have to do too much so I was like yeah sweet so I I went to the racetrack and did it for free and man it was so fun like it was so good to feel a part of the sport again and felt like that learning um all of this stuff over all the years before like well before I started racing spring cars I knew I, I wanted to do it so I wanted to like I was you know, my whole life was, was sprint car racing, even when I was racing go-karts, um, you know, going to the racetrack with my brother. And it kind of felt like it gave a reason again as to why I put all that effort in to, to love the sport. And uh, now I was kind of helping race fans to, to understand what was going on. And, man, it was so fun. We're just sitting there watching the racing. I get asked, hey, you know, what, what do you expect with lap times? Or, you know, why did that crash happen? Or, you know, what's going to happen on the restart? And, you know, I could just give my comments and it was like, just kind of like talking to you while we're watching the racing. And, um, you know, they called me back um, for a few nights after that. And like I said, I was turning up for free and, and I was happy to do that. Um, and then they said, okay, we, for the next year, they wanted me uh, basically full time, um, you know, for the racing, not, not during the week or anything. And mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, sure. So um you know, that, that, that definitely, like I said, gave a reason to, to be involved in the sport again. And I really enjoyed it. When did you start thinking about the YouTube channel? I know you kind of started it here towards the end of, of 2020, but when, when did you start thinking about that? And, and why did you think that was like a, a, a direction to go in? Yeah. So there were a few reasons. Um, I was let go from the, the clay per view thing at Babylon Raceway. Um, they wanted to kind of go in a different direction with how they wanted to do things, which was, which was fine. I was originally doing, I guess, the color commentary and then they moved me over to doing uh, like interviews, um, which I gotta be honest, like I'm, I'm not an interviewer. Like I'm not that guy. Um, I just want to watch the racing and comment on it. That probably sounds a bit lazy, but you know, you know, imagine a, (laughs) Like if you're a football team, you know, you got to, you got to use those players in their positions that they're, they're most useful, you know, and that's where I felt like um, that was my strength and I wanted to, to work towards that. So when they moved me away from that, I thought that's fine. Like I'll, I'll have, give it a go. I don't know about other classes and um, I got to be perfectly honest. I, I, it's not that I don't care. I just don't have a, a big interest in, in other, other categories. I love spring car racing and, and that's all I want to watch and, and know about. And when I had to interview people who were, you know, not, you know, spring car guys and, and I, had, I didn't even get to watch the racing anymore. I was running around getting interviews, so I couldn't comment on that. And I just felt like I was doing a bad job. Um, so when 
they decided that they wanted someone who could who could do the things that um, I couldn't do or didn't want to do. Um, that was fine with me. Um, but I had in my head for a while that I was like, you know, I could probably do something myself here. And um, I, I had my racing page, which was just Toby Belbow and racing on Facebook. And every now and then I would watch racing and I'd just post stuff up. And, you know, what I thought of a crash or what I thought about what would happen or, or any topics like that. And people would just comment and, and we'd have discussions. And I'm like, hey, this is, this is really fun, just talking about racing with, with fans. And, you know, uh, not that they're dumb, but they ask questions because they don't know. And I was like, oh, that's like a really simple answer. Like, this is why this happened. And, you know, all of a sudden they under they understood and had a different perspective on things. And I thought, hey, I could probably turn this into something where I'm, you know, kind of helping people understand the sport, you know, more often. And, and I was like, oh, I was looking at YouTube and, and especially during COVID, I was watching more YouTube. I think everyone was. And I was like, you know, I'm going to going to have a go at this. And um, for a while, I, I, I actually started just on my phone, just editing, uh, editing videos on iMovie um of like there was a, a crash at the classic between Robbie Farr and, and James McFadden and I and I spoke over the top of it and paused it and broke it down what happened and, and where it went wrong and I did the same thing for Ian Madsen's crash at Volusia last year with with Brad Sweet and people seemed to you know I was getting a lot of backlash when I said Ian should have lifted um you know this is just an example but uh, people were like, how could you say that? Why aren't you worried about his safety and that? And I'm like, oh, I'm clearly worried about his safety. I'm just saying like he should have you know, gone about it a different way. And um, so I put a video together explaining why I thought that. And then all of a sudden people were like, oh, okay, I get it. Like, well, that makes sense from a driver's perspective. So, you know, you see a lot of social hate um, and just negative comments. Um, I don't mind being like um, blunt and being honest, but like if I can help a, a race fan understand why something happened and, and why, uh, you know, uh, a driver did something or like how it happened and actually enjoy the sport more and probably stop cussing guys, you know, on social media for no reason. And, and that like, you know, I feel like that's a, there's a market for it, you know. So you, you start Sprint Car Hub and, and, and like kind of looking at your videos now, like you've kind of got like a mix of stuff where you're, you know, you're talking about yeah. some of the stuff with, with the Speedway and, and then you've, you've kind of done some interview stuff. You had Joey Saldana on there and, and Robbie Farr. Yeah. And, and I was jealous because I was trying to talk to Cam Waters because he he's a V8 supercar driver and he was going out to run sprint cars and I was trying to get him and then you got him, which I thought was awesome. Um, but then your most recent videos, which I, I, I pointed out on, on my daily show and, and on social media was talking about traction control and sprint cars. And you actually had like this really awesome breakdown of like how traction control works and the different systems and stuff like that. And I was like, Oh man, like this is like a topic of conversation and like people need to see this, yeah. but like, I feel like maybe that was like, even maybe the future for your, your YouTube channel is kind of some of those like technical explanations, but I thought that was super interesting. It was it, like, there was stuff I didn't know in there and I was like, Oh, okay. Now, now I kind of get how this works, but like, I mean, what are your kind of plans going forward? Are you, know, are you going to kind of keep mixing it up with video types or like, what would you like to do? Yeah. So that was one of the big reasons why I started it. I wanted something that I was in control of. So, you know, when I feel like putting a video out, I'm putting a video out. If I don't feel like putting a video out for three weeks, then I just don't do anything, you know? So it's, it's totally under, you know, my control as to, to what I do and what I put out. And, you know, I created Sprinkle Hub to do unique stuff. Um, I think there's definitely a market for news and, and stuff like that, but I can only understand, like, try and understand you know how tough it is for you to to do the daily stuff and, and some like i said there's definitely a market for it but i was like what is my ideal situation and i thought well me being able to decide what i put out and when i put it out um basically makes me feel probably a bit less stressed um to get content out so i was like okay when i want to put a, a video out about you know the our new speedway which is which is a big deal going back to what we said before we don't have the big population that you guys have um we don't have that many race teams and race tracks all around our country we've got like a handful of premier um 
facilities to race sprint cars on. So to get a brand new, you know, originally it was $40 million speedway, but it's, I don't know, it's, I think it's $40 billion by now, but it's, 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 it's ridiculously expensive, but we're getting a brand new speedway half an hour away and it's going to be, you know, a world-class facility. So that I felt was something to talk about, although it's not, you know, uh, 100% sprint car racing related, um, you know, it's, it's a bit more general speedway. So, um, you know, I want to talk about that um, because it's close to home and will be my local track. I want to talk about sprint car racing mainly. We, we've, we haven't had racing here in Sydney for, for my last sprint car race I went to was about 18 months ago. And for me to put out content, you know, I want it to be quality. And if I can't go to the races, I need to talk about something that um, I can talk about. So, um, you know, to do the stuff about the Speedway was easy. To talk about traction control took a few weeks of, of study and to make sure I got things right. Because as we know, um, if you get something wrong, then fans will, <laughs> people um, are happy to jump on you and, and correct you. Um, I probably still got things wrong. Um, but you know, I, I, there's no, as far as like the direction, there's no one thing. Um, although I do want to get more technical, I want to talk to drivers and really get an understanding on, on what they're thinking and what they go through. Um, not just like in the race car, but obviously out of the race car, like their relationships with, um, their crew chiefs and how they discuss things and, and what they mean and, and, you know, changes on the car. I think people look at the technical side of sprint car racing as just, you know, the race car and its complexities. But to me, if you can separate them, I want to do a bit about the actual race cars. And a lot of it that I'm really interested in is what is the driver thinking with his helmet on and what's he, what's he doing? And, and I just feel like there's a, such a big market for that. And, um, you know, I really, really, truly enjoy thinking about and putting together videos um, about what a driver's going through. So going forward, once we have some sprint car racing here in Sydney, um, and I am going to travel a little bit, um, I, I really just want to talk about sprint car racing rather than generic speedway stuff. Yeah, no, I, and I'm with you on that. I, I'm interested in a lot of those same things too. And I think what's interesting is, is obviously you're in Australia, you're going to be focused on that, but like the stuff that you're going to end up talking about with these guys is going to be stuff that's going to be universal across, you know, the, the kind of the world of, of, of sprint car racing, not just there, but I'll also here too. I think that's really cool. Um, you know, you talked about not having gone to a race in 18 months. What is the state of sprint car racing right now in Australia? And, and I had Ryan Cricky on a few months ago. And he yep. kind of talked about, you know, that, you know, normally they would have gone out and traveled a ton, um, but yeah. they were kind of staying local there to Perth and, and not going too far. Um, but w what is it like right now? I know there's been border closures and all kinds of things, but how yeah. is it kind of looking uh, right now? Yeah, so we're in the middle, basically right in the middle of our off season now. So there shouldn't really be any spring car racing going on other than, say, in the Northern Territory, um, you know, because it's hot up there. But yeah, everyone kind of, a lot of people stayed kind of just close to close to home. Every, we've got seven states here in Australia. So you couldn't travel too much, although some guys did. Um, you know, our COVID problem wasn't as or hasn't been as bad as as what it is in the States. You know, you guys, again, have such a big population. It's a, it's a bigger problem. But, you know, I think yesterday we had I don't know, maybe like 20 people got COVID and everyone's like, oh, what are we going to do? Everyone's got COVID. And it was like, it's all right. It's 20 people out of, you know, millions. It's, it's like we can sort it out. But, you know, this is the first time this past week that I've had to wear a mask at work. Um, and just when you think COVID's over, it's, it's really kind of, it's not. And it's, it's more serious um, probably now. Like I said, I haven't had to wear a mask um, at work um you know since COVID started until this past these past couple of days so we're having a bit of a quick lockdown um as far as spring car racing like I said we're in the middle of our off season um so everyone will be getting their cars ready and stuff but it'll be interesting to see what happens uh the Cricky Motorsport team which I would say is if it's not the top um spring car team here in, in Australia it's, it's definitely a top few and uh they would have traveled basically everywhere um, this past season and, and they just stayed home. So it's been pretty sad. You know, a lot of our big events got canceled. It's probably worked out really well that because of COVID, um, you know, our racetrack was, was shutting down. It kind of, um, you know, gave it a, a transition period, although 
we didn't get a farewell uh, season for Valvoline Raceway after 40 something years. So uh, that, that was pretty upsetting. Your local track, you just never got to kind of really properly say goodbye and enjoy the last season like you should have. So um, at least when we do go back racing, it looks like we're going to, um, you know, it's going to be ready by the start of the season eight, they reckon. And, um, you know, we're going to have a brand new speedway here. What, uh, like, I mean, is it like, do you, do you know the size? I mean, is it going to be similar in setup to, to what Valvoline was? You know, do you want to hear the details about it? Yep. So it's meant to be basically uh, 460 meters on the pole line, which is just over a, a quarter mile. Um, I think a quarter mile is about 400 meters. So it's a, it's a little bit um, more than that, uh, which is exactly what uh, Parramatta was. Uh, Valvoline Raceway. Um, it's a few meters wider because we had um, what they call uh, a trotting track, which was outside the speedway. Um, you know, you have a lot of tracks over there that do the same thing, but instead of having a wall right around the perimeter, it just kind of drops off and then there's a, you know, a boundary, a wall. So, um, you know, it had that, but now we're going to have a speedway that's the same size, but it's got a wall directly around the racetrack. Um, and for that, um, we're going to, they've made it, I think it's, it's about 22 meters wide. Um, so, which is a few meters wider, I believe, than what Valvoline Raceway was um, to allow for, for, um, for, you know, not to, to cramp the racing and, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it'll, it'll be a cool track. I, it's got adjustable banking. Um, and by that, they mean the wall, the concrete wall is um, a fair bit higher than normal so that they can adjust the banking they can move some dirt up the top to make it more banked and that i'm not sure if that's really a standard thing but um it's meant to have a motorbike track on the on the infield um which is i'm not sure if you've heard of the speedway grand prix um solo bikes is that um, like so, a like a flat like a flat track kind of deal or like a yes yeah, similar yeah yeah it's, it's more of a speedway bike with it where they're getting sideways and that mm -hmm. but um you know there's no reason why they couldn't have flat track type stuff there um it's meant to be a multi-purpose facility so um although there is a racetrack there and, and it's going to be similar to valvoline raceway the facility is meant to be used for basically anything and it's actually just got announced um about a day and a half ago which i actually <laughs> believe it or not i actually broke the news um, I found out and, and put it out on my socials um, who's running the Speedway. Um, and it is the um, promoter from Archerfield um, Speedway up in, in Queensland. And another guy who owns and promotes uh, monster trucks all around Australia. So, and he also owns a big screen company. So the people that were selected um, or got, you know, had the winning tender, uh, Again, they promote speedway events. They promote um, monster truck events. They've got big screens. Um, as far as what the speedway will be used for, it could be a, a number of things, but uh, it's not just meant to run uh, speedway racing on, say, a Saturday night for half of the year. It's meant to be used throughout the week and, and that. So it's going to be really interesting to see how the speedway actually gets utilised um, and they reckon they're going to be ready at the start of the season, which is uh, about 10 weeks away. And i got to be honest, I don't know. I can't see it happening. Um, whether the actual track's ready, I can't see the organisation being ready. Um, but either way, in time, we're going to have a, a brand new racetrack, which um, it should be pretty good. That's awesome. Well, uh, I've kept you for 45 minutes today, so that is certainly plenty. I'll, uh, I'll let you go uh, enjoy the rest of your Saturday. But uh, if people want to subscribe to the YouTube channel, if they want to keep up with you on social, like where can they find all of your stuff? Yeah, so the YouTube channel is what I'm really trying to push, which is uh, um, there Spring is. Car Hub. There it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> I also have a, a Facebook page, which a lot of people are on Facebook, um, which again is just Spring Car Hub. There's... Um, just over 6,000 people now. Um, and we have some pretty cool conversations on the, on the Facebook page. I do have Instagram, have Twitter, although um, they're not massive right now, but if people are watching this, they can definitely check them out and, and keep up to date, but definitely subscribe to the YouTube channel, which is what I'll be really pushing on with. And, and I think that is the best part of, of what Spring Car Hub is, is the videos. So um, hopefully uh, a lot of your listeners can, can travel over there um, to my page and, and hopefully I can draw some attention to your page too.
Yeah, for sure. I'll uh, make sure to link everything in, in, in the comments and, and I'll do the little cards on the video and everything. So, well, Toby, I uh, appreciate the time and uh, good luck with everything going forward. Thank you.